Hey, hello, and welcome to the library today. Um, we're so pleased to have Eric Fusilay here today to help us see our natural surroundings in a new way. Eric is an environmental scientist and a math enthusiast who works for a local civil engineering firm where he incorporates nature-based solutions into infrastructure and regional planning projects. Eric is the president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society and a national director for Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting the use of native plants in gardens and landscaping. In his spare time, Eric enjoys learning about and studying math and its applications. So join me in welcoming Eric Fusilay. Hey, uh, thank you all for coming. I uh, appreciate, all right. Yeah, appreciate everybody coming today to uh, hear about this topic. It's one I think is pretty interesting uh, that uh, at least I find it interesting and hope you do too. We're not going to, you know, you don't have to take a test at the end of this, so don't worry. If, if your math wasn't your favorite subject, we're going to stay pretty high level conceptual, uh, not really get too into the weeds on the actual numbers, calculations, that sort of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, numbers in nature, exploring mathematical patterns in the natural world is the topic for today. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, first of all, I'd like to kind of throw up this quote by Galileo Galilei. Uh, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And so math is you know, a useful tool for uh, describing the, the phenomena and uh, processes that we see around us. Uh, and so, you know, just you know, helping us understand not just uh, the world on a large universal scale, but also, you know, the, the, the micro scale as well. So we're going to go into a, a variety of different topics, kind of start basic with some stuff that I think we're probably all familiar with, uh, like symmetry. So symmetry in nature. What is symmetry? Well, an object is said to be symmetrical if it is invariant, meaning unchanging, under some transformation. So uh, or translation, reflection, rotation, scaling. So that could be like, you know, uh, you know, if you fold it along an axis, and if it's the same on both sides of that axis, like you see on the left side versus the right side, or it is different, that is said to be asymmetrical. Uh, if you rotate it like a circle, you know, it's going to be symmetrical uh, if along a, a central point uh, as it's rotated, or as something is scaled up to become larger or smaller, uh, if it retains that invariance, it is said to be symmetrical uh, scaling uh, on, on that uh, scale. So where do we see uh, symmetry in nature? Uh, well, first of all, this reflection symmetry or that symmetry along that axis uh, is one example. So when a line or a plane, if we're talking about three-dimensional objects, intersects an object divided into two pieces, uh, that are mirror images of each other, the object is said to have reflection symmetry. And we see a lot of that uh, with a lot of things like this leaf or, you know, insects, even the human body uh, has that reflection symmetry. Uh, in fact, you know, what we have uh, is commonly called that bilateral symmetry. Animals that are bilaterally symmetric exhibit reflection symmetry along that sagittal plane, which is uh, demonstrated in this uh, image here on the right. Uh, a sa the sagittal plane uh, divides the body vertically into left and right halves with each, with one of each sense organ and limb pair on either side. Uh, most animals are biologically or bilaterally symmetric, likely because it supports forward movement and streamlining. In fact, uh, there's an entire clade or superphylum of animals called bilateria, which we happen to fall in. Um, and it is characterized by bilateral symmetry during embryonic development. So according to the fossil record, uh, this um, taxa of animals evolved around 555 million years ago. So it's been around quite some time. So that's why in the animal kingdom we see a lot of animals with this form of symmetry. And there's also radial symmetry. So for example, the starfish. We also see radial symmetry in other uh, natural organisms, uh, as well as uh, other phenomena like snowflakes. Uh, but you look at this spiderwort flower in the upper right. Did you have a question? Or, oh, sorry, no, just raise your hand, sorry. Um, you know, a lot of flowers, uh, especially ray flowers, will have 
uh, that radial symmetry when looked down upon from above, or the slice of an orange, another example. Scale symmetry. This is an object that has scale symmetry if it does not change shape when it is expanded or contracted. Uh, and so fractals might be considered one form of scale symmetry where smaller portions of the fractal are similar in shape to larger portions. So what is a fractal? That kind of leads us to this next uh, topic we're going to kind of talk about here, which is fractal geometry. And um, fractal geometry is something that's great Nova, PBS Nova documentary uh, on fractal geometry and how it's been utilized. I mean, it's really rev revolutionized a lot of things from computer graphics. Uh, you know, uh, but self-symmetry is one of those aspects of fractal geometry. They are, what are they? They are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. Uh, and it's typically driven by a recursion sort of algorithm. So where you have a, a formula or something that you take the result and then plug it back into itself and you continue to do that. It's called recursive uh, sort of formula. So it creates these uh, created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. So, you know, this idea of self-similarity has been around a while. Uh, here's an example. This was a painting that uh, they bring up in that Nova PBS documentary uh, called uh, The Great Wave, uh, painted back in the early 1800s um, by Katsushika uh, Hokusai. And the, the idea here is it's a wave made up of smaller waves. And we notice this a lot in natural phenomena where uh, things are made up almost of smaller versions of themself, themselves. Sorry. Uh, so Mendelbrot, uh, Benoit Mendelbrot, was uh, one of the first people to actually describe fractal geometry. Uh, and he had developed what's called the Mendelbrot set, uh, which you see here on the left. So here's an example. If we zoom in, what do we see? We see more of these Mandelbrot sets. We see it's self-similar at different scales, smaller and smaller or larger and larger, depending on which way you are zooming in or out. And so it's that self-repetition or self-similarity on different scales that defines these fractals. Another common fractal you might have seen before is a Sierpinski triangle. So, you know, as we zoom in, it's really at different scales, the same sort of pattern or the Serpinski, Serpinski carpet made with these squares. And there are different formulas or algorithms that would help you uh, if you ran them and plotted points or your, your answers onto a graph, it would create these different patterns, these different fractals. Well, nature is full of fractals, it turns out. So where might we see some of these fractals in nature? Uh, uh, fractal branching being one example. You know, you take a simple rule and then apply it over and over again and it can result in a complex shape. So that rule could be that uh, when something is growing and it uh, divides, it divides into two pieces or three pieces or it divides first to the right, grows a little bit more, then divides to the left. And so, you know, branching is seen in all sorts of uh, growth in, in biological organisms from trees. So Here's like say one iteration of fractal branching. You have a trunk going up and it splits into two, second iteration. And then at the terminal branch or terminal node of each of those trunks, that then splits into two. And then those split into two and so on and so forth. And so this would be an example of the self-similarity at different scales uh, through biological growth. So in this example, this would be if you take it to, I don't know how many iterations that would be. But here's an example if it were to split into uh, six different branches. So it kind of creates these different shapes, and these are pretty idealized versions of uh, that simple pattern. But you can see it, if you come, think about not just the number of branches, but the angle at which they grow off uh, the primary branch. It can kind of create different shapes or crowns on these different types of trees. So when we think about the genetic code and uh, how uh, organisms are, um, their DNA tells them to grow, 
Uh, I would suspect that some of this is more or less encoded into it because when you learn about trees and tree identification, you'll start to realize or start to notice that certain species have certain ways that their crowns are shaped, you know, certain ways that their uh, certain growth patterns. <coughs> So, but then there's always the, the non-living environment that acts upon these biological organisms. None of these organisms are perfect, right? Uh, there's all sorts of damage that occurs. There's, you know, wind, storms, um, you, know, you know, insect infestations. So you're not seeing these perfect idealized versions of these trees like you might if it was purely in a mathematical world or, you know, virtual world where there's no, uh, no uh, environment acting upon it. I mean, lightning, uh, another potential um, way that some of these branches could be lost or damaged. Also, just maybe asymmetrical growth due to different spatial constraints. You know, or maybe a light is obstructed on one side or it's growing next to a wall, and so it can only grow one direction. And so you end up with these natural trees that we see in the real world uh, that don't look completely symmetrical or, you know, but whenever they do these studies and they uh, map out these trees and they uh, run these statistical analyses, they realize that uh, these do tend to follow this fractal geometry or statistically uh, should in absence of the abiotic environment. You know, we see this same branching pattern in uh, the way leaves grow. So you have the different leaves, you see the central uh, vein of the leaf or the leaf stem, uh, and then the veins come off of it. Uh, then you have these uh, tertiary veins that grow off of those secondary veins and so forth. Uh, ferns, another example of the self-similarity. So a, a fern leaf as it grows is called a frond. Uh, then off of that, that total frond is also made up of smaller, uh, in what we call pinae uh, in the fern world. And each of those uh, leaflets, so to speak, has these tertiary leaflets that uh, kind of repeat that same general pattern and, and have the same shape as the overall frond. So here's an example as you look at the different components, you kind of see the same shape as, as the whole. Uh, and Michael Barnsley uh, developed uh, an algorithm uh, that can be used to generate these ferns uh, in computer graphics. So if you really want to geek out, uh, here they are. Here, this is the, the formula to, to do that with, but it will create uh, that image of a fern that you see there. You know, think about birds' feathers also. Um, you know, whenever, back when, you know, birds were still dinosaurs, um, you know, their first feathers were really, they were modified scales, just like hairs on mammals, you know, evolved from modified scales on the, on the reptiles, and they originally were just that one central um, you call that part, we have birders here. Uh, and what's that central part of the, uh, the quill? Sorry. Uh, you know, and so they think T-Rex or some of these early members of that uh, section of uh, uh, dinosaurs were covered in quills, uh, not so much with these complex feathers that had these uh, secondary and tertiary growths on them, but over time, uh, those feathers evolved to, to what we see here today um, with, our, with our modern birds. Uh, we also find fractals in river morphology, uh, where we see the, the bends in the rivers and the sinuosity seems to have a self-repetition uh, on different scales at different points in a watershed. Now, here's a highly sinuous river, just throwing that out there. Uh, in mountains, uh, if you, when, they, when fractals and their ability to be used in computer graphics was first discovered, it was when they were trying to use mountains or design mountains that were realistic for uh, test, fight, uh, test flights uh, for airplanes. And so uh, what they found is that they took a triangle and they took that triangle or a three-dimensional pyramid or whatnot uh, and divided it into pieces that were smaller than divided those. And, you know, so basically you had smaller mounds on top of smaller, larger ones on top of larger ones on top of larger ones. And you could randomize that. You got a more naturalized looking mountain, but when we think about uh, hills and mountains in the landscape, a lot of that is just uh, smaller mounts on top of larger ones, on top of larger ones, uh, dotted across the landscape and more of a less a random um, 
distribution. And so then this brings us to this Fibonacci sequence, which relates somewhat to this uh, scale symmetry. And I'll talk about that here in just a minute. But who was Fibonacci? Well, his real name was Leonardo of Pisa, later known as Fibonacci, lived back uh, in the uh, 12th and 13th centuries. And a Fibonacci number, or the Fibonacci sequence, is a number in which each number is a sum of the two preceding ones. So you start with zero and one, and then you add those together to get the next number. So zero plus one is one. One plus one is two. Two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight, and so on and so forth. So just to repeat, you add, to get the next number, you add the previous two numbers together. And these appear very often in mathematics, uh, so much so that there's an entire journal dedicated to it, uh, Fibonacci Quarterly. And also, they seem to be very common in nature. We'll talk about why here in a little bit. So where do we see these in nature? Well, uh, we see the Fibonacci numbers often when we uh, consider the number of petals on a flower. Uh, three, uh, we can find, uh, see threes show up a lot in petals, uh, especially, you know, we look at trilliums or pawpaws, we see these other secondary set of what looks like petals, usually they're sepals uh, or they can be leaves. Uh, five is another common number for petals on flowers. For bloodroot, uh, a native species here, frequently seen with five or eight petals. Black-eyed Susans very commonly have 13 petals. And also the, the sides that we see of some of these flowers with these pentagonal, pentagonal shape flowers like we see with wild potato vine or swamp mallow, uh, Carolina horse nettle. A lot of times these flowers are short, uh, form these pentagon shape structures. Also the number of uh, pine needles in a pine sprig. So uh, if you want to learn how to separate the different groups of pines, whether it be the whites, reds, or yellows, uh, generally you count the number of needles in each one of those little uh, pine bundles. So red pines have two needles per bundle. Those in the yellow pines, which are common where we are, have two or three, both Fibonacci numbers, while white pines, which are more common up north, have five needles per bundle. Also, again, tree branching. <clears throat> Fibonacci numbers can be found in the type of growth exhibited by simple tree growth. So new shoots commonly grow out of what we call the axle, and that's a point where a leaf springs from the main stem of a plant. But if we draw horizontal lines through the axles to delineate each year's growth, uh, we start to see that uh, the main stem, and it's a common growth pattern in many trees, uh, will, while they produce, when they produce a new uh, branch, uh, then they tend to rest that following year before creating another branch off of that. Uh, a lot of times when you're looking at leaves, you look at the axle, you can see the growth for next year's branch, the little bud. Uh, so if we draw these lines, and of course this is a, a perfectly growing tree that all these lines happen to be horizontal. Uh, a real tree, you'd have to do a, a you know, a lot more, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a perfectly horizontal line. But um, what we find is that the number of branches each year turns out to be Fibonacci numbers. And that's really just due to this growth pattern where a new branch is produced, but then it waits another year before it uh, starts producing uh, additional branches off of it. So if you, yeah, for each year there, you can count uh, at the very top, you end up with 13 branches. The year before there were eight, before that five. So um, we also see this in what's called phyllotaxis, which is the arrangement of leaves on a stem. So, for example, this plant here on the right, if we start with uh, year or leaf zero at the bottom, and if we count up the stem until we find a leaf that is directly above that first one, uh, we generally find that it's uh, a Fibonacci number. So as these uh, leaves are growing off the plant, if you look down from the top, you'll see that they grow off at different angles, uh, generally uh, rotating around and then 
when you finally make it back around to the original angle, uh, it generally happens after a certain iteration that is a Fibonacci number. The number of leaves and the number of rotations can also be expressed as a ratio. So in this case, uh, the number of leaves it took to get back to that original position where it was eight, but the number of revolutions that that took, so you have multiple leaves coming off per revolution, is also usually a Fibonacci number. And so the, uh, so when we express this as a ratio, the plant is said to have a phyllotaxis of five to eight in this case. So yeah, each species is typically characterized by its own phyllotaxis. Like I mentioned, these tend to be uh, consecutive or alternate terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, some common phyllotaxic ratios of some of the uh, tree species out there for beaches is one to three, hazelnut one to three, oaks two to five, poplars three to eight, willows five to 13. We also see Fibonacci numbers in Peristyches, or which is the spiral phyllotaxis of plant organisms or plant organs on some plants. So in this case, the bract of pine cones. Uh, as the pine cone grows, uh, we see that each bract is arranged in the spiral pattern. And we can see different ways that the spiral pattern can be traced. And if we count the number of bracts on each of those patterns, we typically arrive at a Fibonacci number. So in many cases, 13 for clockwise, eight for counterclockwise. Uh, Ken Trimble, uh, with the, his uh, um, park interpreter at, um, oh, I'm trying to remember where he's at, but he uh, has this great exercise he likes to do with kids where they take pine cones and they'll uh, count the number of bracts and uh, finds that, you know, when they start getting to all these numbers and then they start looking at those numbers and then he introduces to them the Fibonacci sequence and explains uh, how that's connected. And we'll talk about why here pretty soon. But also the arrangement of flowers and uh, the composite flower of a sunflower head. Oftentimes in uh, clockwise spirals, well, you'll have 34 of those little flowers. A composite flower head is basically, it's a array or disc that's made up of multiple flowers. Each one of those things in the center is a flower and what we would think of as the petal uh, isn't really a true petal. And then 21 uh, uh, flowers in the counterclockwise direction. They've also found this to be true with pineapples. So somebody in 1970 decided to start really looking at a pineapple more closely and found that uh, the way these were, uh, these different spiral patterns were arranged and the number of different fruitlets on the pineapple, if they counted it uh, in three different directions, uh, they would always come up with these Fibonacci numbers. And a lot of this has to do with the golden ratio. So what is the golden ratio? It's generally represented by the symbol phi and it comes to approximately 1.618, and it defines a relationship between two numbers that when detected in visible objects, it's generally considered pleasing to the human eye. Uh, they don't know exactly why that is, but they've noticed uh, when they've looked back or uh, that the golden ratio has been known for quite some time, uh, going back to ancient times. But mathematically, the golden ratio is uh, if two quantities are in the golden ratio to each other, is if the, uh, the ratio to each other is the same as the ratio of their sum of the larger of the two quantities. Now, what does that mean? So we see uh, this line here uh, is divided up into two segments, X and Y. And so X and Y are in the golden ratio to each other is if, if that ratio is the same as the ratio of the larger segment, y, to the total, or to the whole. Let that sink in just a little bit. So German mathematician Simon Jacob noted that uh, consecutive Fibonacci numbers also converge to the golden ratio. So whenever they, uh, you divide, you take this Fibonacci sequence, 
and you divide one number by the number before it, uh, the, the higher or further along you get in that sequence, the closer you get to that golden ratio. In other words, it converges to the golden ratio. Uh, this was again rediscovered by Johannes Kepler, 1608. So if we took the Fibonacci numbers and we mapped them, so uh, like squared each number. So we start off with one, you got uh, a unit of one by one. And then above that, uh, you put a square of two, and then three, three by three square, five by five square, an eight by eight square, and so on and so forth. You start to get this pattern. And if we wanted to map a line from the corner of one square to the corner of the other square on a curved, and we could create this sort of spiral. And we see this spiral in a lot of different places, but we also see that when you zoom in or out, it will tend to have this self-similarity on different scales. And so artists and architects have known about the golden ratio and this golden spiral and have incorporated it into their art um, or designs. We know that the Parthenon the different uh, lengths or the heights of the different segments of the Parthenon were in the golden ratio to each other. It's something that uh, people that my understanding, I didn't go to architect, I didn't study architecture in school, but my understanding a lot who do uh, learn about the golden ratio in their architecture classes because it has a certain pleasingness to the human eye. But we also commonly find this golden ratio in the spiral in natural phenomenon, especially as it relates to the way organisms grow. We also see it uh, in, large, uh, in larger phenomena, in non-biological phenomena, uh, such as hurricanes, where we have uh, a double spiral coming off this, as well as the way galaxies form, spiral galaxies in particular. On the large scale, we also have seen, uh, found that the diameter of Saturn, the ratio of the diameter of Saturn to the diameter of its rings is very close to the golden ratio. And in our solar system, the average of the ratios of the orbital radii of each planet, or orbital radius, sorry, of each planet to the orbital radius of the planet before it averages out to the golden ratio. Each one's not perfect but when you take them all and you average them, uh, it has a degree of variance of 0 0.00043. And so this also kind of leads us into what's called the golden angle. And the golden angle related to the golden ratio is the smaller of two angles created by sectioning the circumference of a circle according to the golden ratio. So when we take the arcs or the sections of the circumference and we create the links that would be in the golden ratio to each other, and then we take the smaller angle that's created by those arcs, that angle is what's known as the golden angle. And it comes to approximately 137.5 degrees. And so we see this golden angle and the spiral phyllotaxis of plants. Uh, this, what this does is this pattern allows organisms to grow without changing shape. So we're, we're bringing into that self-similarity or that scale symmetry like we talked about with fractals. Uh, we talked about the way uh, fruitlets and whatnot are arranged on a plant or, or the leaves. And so whenever a, a plant is producing its leaves, if we were to look down at that plant we talked about earlier from above, we see uh, one leaf grow and then 137.5 degrees over, it puts out another leaf. And we continue that uh, another 170 or 137.5 degrees and so on. It's not likely to overlap. Uh, it's gonna take a little longer before it reaches some sort of overlap. I mean, here we are going all the way up to 13 iterations. And so back here, we see that some of these plants, especially when it comes to the, the uh, sunflower heads, um, pine cones, um, broccoli, cauliflower, all sorts of things uh, have this golden ratio in the way they grow and develop. 
And what it does is it optimizes the packing of modules, such as these seeds or fruits. So it's able to arrange these things in such a way that uh, basically optimizes the use of space or that volume. So what about pi? Let's get into pi just a little bit. What is pi? Well, that's the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, approximately 3.14159. Kind of goes on forever. Uh, there are some that say that uh, pi is seen in river morphology. Now, as I was looking into this, there are also some who say it doesn't. So take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but what happens on rivers on large scale, you know, as uh, a river has a, they tend to want to bend and curve and whatnot. And so with these, this high, the, as the water is hitting one bank, it'll erode it away eventually, uh, and eventually it'll break through and reconnect and leave these oxbow lakes. But then it'll start to um, kind of go that other way. If you look at the, if you look at on Google Earth and you look at the Mississippi River Valley, I mean, you'll see where that thing used to flow, you know, millions of years ago by where it left all these oxbows. And so it's just a natural part of how rivers, even creeks here and down the valleys in the Ozarks, uh, do the same thing along their flood, floodplain. But uh, if we take what's called the sinuosity of a river, which is when we measure uh, the length of the meandering river for Big L, which is what we call like river miles, so you, that's that dotted line uh, going along the length of the river, and divide that by the straight line distance that that river has flowed um, as the crow flies, so to speak, we get the measure of its sinuosity. And there are uh, some out there, some studies that have said that uh, what we see that sinuosity on average when we look at the world's rivers tends to approach pi. Now I've seen other studies that say that's not the case. But the explanation for it is that the length of a near circular, circular loop, hence this uh, loop here, is kind of like the circumference of a circle. And the length of the distance, that straight line distance of one bend to the next, is similar to a diameter. And so when pi is the ratio of the circumference to the diameter, that's why it would naturally approach pi on average across all the rivers in the world. But uh, I haven't gone in and looked at all the rivers on Google Earth and done this myself, so do your own research. All right, so what about prime numbers? Where might we see these in the natural world? What are prime numbers? A prime number is a natural number greater than one that is not the product of two smaller natural numbers. So think about um, numbers that can't be, uh, that can be divided by other things, like you know, four can be divided by two, right? So these natural numbers that are not prime are called composite numbers. They're made up of other numbers. Three and three make six, you know, three and two make five. Uh, those are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, three and two together, I guess the composite would be uh, six. But uh, prime numbers are basically because they cannot be, they can only be divided by one in themselves, uh, are typically considered the building blocks of all the other numbers that the composite numbers are built from. So if, here's a list of all the prime numbers between one and 100. You'll notice that none of these can be divided by anything other than one and itself. Notice that none of them are even numbers, because all even numbers can be divided by two, right? So primes are going to be odd, uh, except for the number two. So where do we find prime numbers in nature? Cicadas. And we have uh, one of these events coming up this year. Now, there are different kinds of cicadas. You know, we have annual cicadas, and these appear every year. Uh, there's a lot of species that are annual cicadas. They remain underground as nymphs for two or more years, and the population is not locally synchronized in its development, so that each year there's going to be an adult that comes to the surface, or more than one adult, that you're going to hear. Then we have these periodical cicadas, and these are the ones that are uh, synchronized, uh, locally synchronized with the others, they stay underground multiple years, uh, but nearly all individuals in a local population are developmentally synchronized and emerge in the same year. Uh, so around the world, we see this as 7, 13, and 17 years, which are all primes. 
uh, we believe in this, our region here, this uh, coming up in late spring, early summer, we'll be seeing uh, a brood that is on a 13 year cycle. So the last time that species came up uh, was, what would that have been, 2011? So, and then I think further, a little bit northeast of here, was it maybe Illinois, there's gonna be a 13 and a 17 year brood at the same time. Uh, and the reason why uh, they do this is uh, well, there's different theories. First, what's called predator satiation. That's where so many of these insects are coming out that the predators can't possibly eat them all. Uh, so there's just so many, too many, they're overwhelmed, they can eat some of them, uh, but that ensures that there's always gonna be more uh, for these future cycles. But also, if they're choosing these prime numbers, since these prime numbers, not being composite numbers, um, or generally, it's going to take a, a long time, like 200-something years usually, uh, before you can have a composite number that consists of uh, 13 and 17. So what is uh, 13 times 17, you know? Um, so that, that brood, that, the 13 and 17-year brood that are both arising at the same time, that's something that doesn't occur very often, maybe every you know, couple centuries or few centuries. Um, you Basically, however many years that's divisible by both 13 and 17 and some other number. Um, and, and they think that the reason why they do it in these primes is because that way they're not also competing with other uh, cicada broods that are on different cycles. See, if they, because uh, there's a possible possibility that they could uh, mate, hybridize, and potentially mess up their uh, on brood cycle if a 13 year brood was to a hybridized somehow with a 17 year brood. So luckily that doesn't happen very often because they're using these prime numbers uh, when they emerge. So sometimes I get ahead of myself. So yeah, it looks like the 13 and 17 year cicadas uh, are different species that only overlap every 221 years. Also bamboo flowering so kind of related to prime numbers. Again, the bamboo uh, species have these long uh, periods between flowering. They primarily reproduce asexually uh, through cloning. Uh, river cane is one of our native bamboo species. Uh, doesn't flower very often, but when they look at uh, those species that do flower, it's typically, uh, they have some species that are every 12, 32, 60, even up to 120 years uh, between flowering events for some species around the world. Uh, predator satiation is one of the theories behind these long bloom periods. One of the things that will eat a lot of their uh, flowers and seeds and whatnot are rodents and rats, and so they think that if they just put out so much that they're just not able to be uh, possibly eaten uh, at one year, then they have a possibility of having that sexual reproduction where they can get some of that genetic variety, uh, mutations, that sort of thing, uh, so they don't become... Um, vulnerable as a species. So one hypothesis claims that uh, these flowering intervals grew by integer multiplication. So at some point there was a mutant bamboo that flowered at a non-integer multiple of its population's flowering interval, interval and would release its seeds alone and would not receive the benefits of collective flowering for that predator satiation benefit, right? However, a mutant, a bamboo mutation that would flower at one of the integer multiples of its population's flowering interval, meaning like if they flowered every three years, uh, suddenly it, <clears throat> an integer, integer multiple might be six, you know, nine, 12, uh, then it would get uh, that benefit of flowering in line with its species, uh, but uh, it would then release more seeds uh, than the average plant in the population and can therefore take over um, that population or its genetics would uh, become dominant in that population and so start extending the flowering period of that population. But it would be a multiple of the original population's uh, bloom interval. So the hypothesis predicts that observed bamboo flowering interval should factorize into small prime numbers such as two, three, and five, uh, which are called smooth numbers. Yeah. So looking at Matt here, who is a mathematician. <laughs> uh, smooth numbers apparently are what we call these small prime numbers. And I just learned this by putting this together. So um, 
But yeah, so when they look at you know, this integer multiplication, it started off as a prime number that then multiplied by two, four, six over time uh, to get these longer and longer bloom periods. So that's that hypothesis there. All right, hexagons. Get into a little geometry in nature and why hexagons are so common. Uh, one place we see these, you know, a good place, a good example would be bubbles. Uh, when bubbles are created, uh, the sphere encloses a maximum volume with the least surface area to minimize surface tension, right? Because uh, you have that film, it wants to minimize surface tension. And so when it comes to any sort of area, um, you know, a circle or a three-dimension a, 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 a sphere is going to provide uh, that maximum volume with the least amount of surface area. But if we take a straw and we blow another bubble next to that one and they converge or press against each other, you know, we, it creates that straight line boundary of 180 degrees. If we add a third one, we start to see the angle becomes 120. And that also stays true when we add a fourth. Uh, it remains for, for uh, 120. And the surface tension wants to minimize the perimeter. And so uh, to help uh, reduce the surface uh, tension of that uh, the bubble, the film that's creating this uh, the outer part of the bubble. And so by minimizing the perimeter, um, this uh, 120 degrees turns out to be uh, very effective. It's also the internal angle uh, that you see in hexagons. So why hexagons? Well, again, minimizing the perimeter. Uh, the pull of surface tension in each direction is most mechanically stable in these sorts of um, um, repeating patterns when we're using 120 degrees. So most shapes would leave gaps in between. So when it comes to organizing, finding a shape uh, that's going to maximize the use of space, if we started with circles, like with the first bubble, you know, that would leave gaps in between each shape. You know, at most, the circles can only cover about 90% of the area on a plane. But it turns out that triangles, squares, and hexagons can be put together to where there are no gaps in between the shapes. Not only that, but hexagons minimize the perimeter for a given area uh, when compared to triangles and squares. They use the least amount of material to cover the most space. So if we had this square, we wanted to count up or measure out the, the different lines between the shapes in each type, we'll find that hexagons have the least amount per area. So it has the best balance of fewer edges and mechanical uh, stability. And so that's why nature, uh, especially when it comes to bubbles, uh, wants to revert to that 120 degree angle. Same with honeycombs and bees. You know, the way these honeycombs start, uh, the bees will make these round wax cells at first, but as they're working in their hives and they uh, create warmth, uh, those wax cells start to get pulled and uh, pushed to each other and end up creating this uh, hexagon shape. Uh, yeah, they start off as circles, but as they expand and contract and pull and push, they become hexagons. Also, basalt columns, another place we see hexagons in nature. Basalt columns are formed from slowly cooling lava. You know, so as the lava cools and it wants to contract, uh, cracks form to release that tension, uh, and it wants to reach mechanical stability. And it turns out more energy is released per crack if they meet at 120 degree angles. So again, those 120 degree angles creating these hexagons. We also find it in the compound eyes of insects. So by maximizing the light sensing area while minimizing the amount of cell material around the edges is going to be beneficial to that insect. So nature wants to seek out these lowest energy states or this most efficiency. Uh, in this case, it's probably driven by evolutionary pressures and uh, biological growth, uh, other states that might be you know, with the cooling of the, the lava and creating basalt uh, columns, you know, it's just a process uh, that um, this 120 degree angle seems to provide uh, the uh, maximum amount of uh, ability to facilitate seeking out that low energy state. 
What about Voronoi patterns? Did I say that right, Matt? I don't know. Okay, I tried to look this up. Voronoi, Voronois, I don't know. It's kind of related to these hexagons. Uh, who was uh, Voronoi? Well, he lived in uh, late 19th century, uh, passed away uh, beginning of the 20th century. He was a Russian mathematician of Ukrainian descent. These patterns is where you take a surface, you divide it into irregular geometric cells that touch each other. And every point within a given cell is closer to the seed, which are these dots you see here, inside that region than it is to any other point outside that region. So wrap our minds around that a little bit. Each point along a region's edge is equal distance or equally distant from the two nearest seeds. So if we just randomly toss out the seed points onto a, uh, a diagram, this is kind of how these patterns begin. It starts to expand out, so it's equidistant at first, hence a circle. But when they start to bump up against another edge, they tend to form these lines. And that's where we get these Voronoi patterns. So these patterns showcased a natural tendency to find the nearest neighbor or shortest path in the tightest fit. So it's a geometrical tool to understand the physical constraints that drive the growth and organization of biological tissues in one instance. So kernels and how they grow on a corn cob. They start off small, but as they grow and they will eventually develop this shape and it's trying to get the tightest fit. Um, but that's why we can describe the way these kernels look by Voronoi. Patterns, uh, cells and plants, uh, the way uh, leaves grow, leaves grow, corkwood, it's the way that biological tissue grows, even the patterns on giraffes can be described by Voronoi patterns and the wings of dragonflies, bone. This is a microscopic look at bone or a small scale look at uh, how it's composed. But we also see it in non-biological areas like in the way mud dries and cracks form. Again, with that releasing that uh, surface tension, you know, you're more likely to see the 120 degree uh, angles than any other. But they can also be described by these Voronoi patterns. We also see these at much larger scales as well. And I'll go into this, we're going to kind of start local and kind of work our way out. So we're in a galaxy, the Milky Way, right? Well, our galaxy is part of a galaxy group. You know, galaxy groups, these are groups of galaxies uh, that are, these are the smallest aggregate unit of what astronomers, when they're looking at uh, the night sky, typically contain no more than 50 galaxies uh, in a diameter of 1 to 2 megaparsecs. Groups are the most common, uh, these groups are the most common structure of galaxies in the universe, comprising at least 50% of the galaxies in the local universe. Now, our local galactic group contains our own Milky Way galaxy, and as well as 54 other galaxies. That's what we call our galaxy group, the local galactic group. Uh, it's 10 million light years wide, it's pretty big and is on the edge of a collection of galaxy clumps called the Virgo Supercluster. So here's a, a map of all the local superclusters. These galaxy clusters is a structure that consists of anywhere from hundreds to thousands of galaxies that are bound together by gravity. And you can see our Virgo Supercluster called out here in the middle in yellow and they've named uh, some of the other superclusters that they've identified. The Virgo supercluster is 110 million light years across, uh, and it's also an appendage of the larger Laniakia supercluster, which is 500 million light years across, and comprises approximately 100,000 other nearby galaxies. So this is a picture you may have seen get spread on social media, depending on what you like to follow or the internet. And that's when they've mapped out uh, the Laniakia supercluster. Uh, these galaxy superclusters, uh, there are 10 million 
total that we have uh, estimate in the uh, observable universe, and they are gravitationally bound into galactic filaments, these long lines made up of galaxy groups and superclusters. So on a large scale, these are some of the largest structures we know of currently in the universe, gravitationally bound, uh, 160 to 260 million light years in size. Here's a picture of uh, the Laniakia supercluster. Our Milky Way, or our local galaxy group, is right here, this red dot, and uh, that appendage of it. Well, galactic filaments are surrounded by voids that contain very little matter. Voids are 30 to 300 million light years across. So we have labeled the ones that are around our supercluster, like the Bootes void and uh, Capricornus void. We use a lot of these, like the Canis major void. You know, a lot of times they are in which direction you're looking in the sky and what constellation is that uh, direction. But at the largest scales we can currently observe, these filaments, walls, and voids form this vast cosmic web. Not only that, but when they do their mathematical statistical analysis, uh, it's been found that these, this cosmic web also conforms to Voronoi patterns in these voids and with the matter being along the edges. So something you see on our scale and on the largest scales in the universe that we're currently aware of. So I'll leave you with that. Any questions? Thank you. Yes. I was wondering if there's any correspondence between something like the Fibonacci series and um, one of the other kinds of patterns, because some of the numbers numbers seem similar, mm -hmm. like the, with I, three point mm -hmm. one four. You know. I don't know about common. Uh, you sort of correlation them with pi, but definitely with the golden ratio, the golden angle, uh, and then with the, the concept of uh, scale symmetry, you know, it's definitely uh, all tied in together uh, with that. But prime numbers and pi, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, the prime numbers uh, seem to have more to do with the timing and making sure that uh, processes aren't overlapping and are occurring, synchronizing in time, uh, whereas the Fibonacci numbers seem to be more about spatial arrangement of the, you know, and the golden angle and how uh, flower petals grow and flowers are able to maximize the space and fruitlets on a pine cone or pineapple are able to maximize that use of space without having gaps in between them. Uh, so I think that's generally where, where those numbers come up. Now, not all plants uh, follow that Fibonacci sequence. Uh, it's just uh, quite a few of them do because it gives them that advantage. And they look back at the fossil record, and there was a time when uh, none of the plants really uh, followed that Fibonacci sequence. So I think it was just, it provided an evolutionary advantage for those that did. Uh, and so they were able to spread their genes because they were able to maximize uh, their, their use of space. So That's all very practical. Right, right, yeah, you can, yeah. It, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know of a real-world daily application of any of this, but it's definitely as far as uh, just appreciating it and understanding it as you're walking around or hiking in the woods or, you know, try to look for some of these patterns and, you know, go out there and, you know, see which species of plants might be uh, conforming to this Fibonacci pattern or, you know, understanding why certain, you know, why mud's cracking the way it is, you know, and it's, um, I don't know, it just, I think it, uh, it's just interesting to geek out on. No. I don't know how to use it, you know, in your garden every day. No. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Why don't we live in hexagonal houses? You know, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's a good use of, you know, way to maximize the use of space. You know, maybe uh, apartments should be, uh, well, I guess we use squares a lot in housing. Uh, you know, maybe it also has to do with construction and uh, Cutting angles is easier when it's a right angle than if it's a 120 degree angle. So um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think for multi-housing units that, you know, there might be some benefit there. Yeah. Anyone else?
All right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it.